Welcome to the webinar, Following the Fish, a recap of the 2020 Connecticut Fish Run. Uh, I'm Anthony Allen, the Ecological Communications Specialist here at Save the Sound, and we're excited to welcome you into this, uh, this presentation by John Vanderwerf, who is our fish biologist. John is amazing, he does such great work, and uh, he's also wild about fish. So we're excited to have him presenting today on this and on the results of the fish run this year. Uh, for those of you who are not as familiar with Save the Sound and the work that we do, we are a regional nonprofit that leads environmental action in the Long Island Sound region. We do that in a number of ways. We do it by fighting climate change. We do it by protecting and preserving threatened and endangered lands. We do it uh, through our water quality work and watchdogging work to protect Long Island Sound and its rivers. And we do it through hands-on work, uh, working with nature and natural ecosystems to restore them for the benefit of wildlife and humans alike. And today, we're gonna be talking about one very critical aspect of what we do, uh, monitoring, the, the monitoring work that John does is important in informing both our ongoing restoration efforts and our advocacy efforts at the state, local, and national levels. So without any further ado, uh, John, why don't you go ahead and take it away? All right, well, th thank you very much. So uh, like you said, we'll start the webinar now and um, we'll do a little bit of the recap of the 2020 uh, fish run of Connecticut. So, um, why we're monitoring. Um, Save the Sound in 2015-2016 received a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, to remove the Hyde Pond Dam in Whitford Brook in Mystic, Connecticut. It restored over 4.1 miles of migratory fish habitat and reconnected the river to its floodplains. That same winter, in February 2016, Save the Sound uh, pulled down the Pond Lily Dam in the West River in New Haven, Connecticut. This restoration project restored 2.6 miles of stream, restored the passage of migratory fish into 2.6 miles of stream, and um, provided access to 76 acres of pond habitat for diadromous fish. Um, why the dams were removed? They were aimed, they were removed to improve passage for alewife, blueback herring, American eel, American shad, gizzard shad, sea lamprey, and sea run brook trout. They were also uh, prevented, uh, pulled down to prevent catastrophic dam failure and to reduce the probability of flooding in neighborhoods uh, downstream. So how the monitoring works. Um, in 2017, like I, like I mentioned, um, Save the Sound was awarded funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife Service to support the monitoring. This permit and um, funding required monitoring for five years because both of these sites were Hurricane Sandy Restoration and Resilience Fund sites. That's where the funding came from. Um, the monitoring is conducted by Save the Sound, me and my colleagues, and then also deep fisheries divisions as well. And all of the data that's collected by me and uh, deep fisheries is compiled by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the end of each field season. So the permit specifics. I had to apply for a Connecticut State um, Scientific Collector's Permit for non-lethal trapping. So I was not allowed to collect any of the fish they had to be released upstream of the trap immediately, unharmed. Nothing was taken. They were immediately taken from inside the trap, outside, the, and released up upstream. Um, all of these traps were coordinated very closely with deep staff. I talked to them multiple times a week and reported upon my findings and then submitted paper copies at the end of each week as well. So, 2020 monitoring sites. We had Hyde Pond and Pond Lily, which you can see in New London County in green is Hyde Pond, and in New Haven County in purple 
is Pond Lily, and those are the two U.S. Fish and Wildlife sites. And then also we had a few other sites added on this year because of interest in where the fish are migrating throughout different watersheds and areas we're interested in studying. So we also had one in Alewife Cove in yellow and one in the Norwalk River in Wilton in orange. Both of these are where we have projects moving forward. So we did a presence absence survey there to see if there were fish there currently or were there not fish there. Um, we also did one at Long Pond and Haley's Pond and those were areas immediately adjacent to projects we already ha have working on in either upstream in the watershed or in an adjacent watershed, getting an idea of how far these fish are actually migrating in the area to get a better understanding of how the fish migration is working each year. And then we have a past Save the Sound project site that Connecticut Deep monitors in blue um, here in New, New London County, and that's Bridebrook, which was a 2009 culvert restoration project that I'll touch on a little bit more later. So the methods. The main method was a run of the river diadromous fish funnel trap. You can see here um, in the diagram, the water is coming from the right, coming downstream. The fish are migrating upstream from the left. They get funneled into the trap and into that box. I also had a culvert, a similar trap that was modified for a culvert, which you can see in the top picture here, very similar, but just on the upstream side. So the water is coming from screen left into the culverts through the boxes and the fish are migrating up. So those were used for the presence absence surveys of the culverts. So a little bit about site specifics. It's rather challenging to find a really good site for fish trapping for multiple reasons. You wanna avoid obviously as much mortality as possible. So you need to think of the fish and not so much as where it's convenient for you. So for what we're looking for is something upstream of the dam removal site to prove that the fish were able to move it all the way through the dam removal site, past where the dam was, through everything to sh show that now the entire dam removal site is passable to these fish. And then upstream of the culvert, if we are studying the culvert, to see if the fish can make it through the culvert. Now the water has to be deep enough to protect these fish. So you can see in the diagram in the bottom, the velocity at the top in the darker blue is moving faster than the velocity at the bottom and the light and at the bottom in the lighter blue, there's more friction of the water as the water gets deeper, so it's slower moving. And then you can see in the diagram in the right, it slows and makes that kind of a curl. So it gives it kind of a, a the fish a better spot to to kind of keep swimming and migrating instead of being on the top where the velocity is higher and they're more susceptible to predators. But with that, you have a trap in the water, so if the velocity is too high, the velocity at the top, even though the velocity at the bottom is good for the fish, the velocity at the top will blow your trap downstream. So you want to find a sweet spot between where it's deep enough for the fish to have their nice slow water and they're protected from predators, but you don't want the velocity at the top to be too high where it pulls your trap down. Um, you also kind of want a natural bottleneck in the river, so you're not blocking off an entire reach of the river that's a 30-foot wide river. You kind of want a, a little bit of a, less material to work with. And then you want to try to keep the river in the thaw, uh, the trap in the thaw leg of the river, in that main channel of the river. So when the water fluctuations, you can always count on that the trap's going to be there. And also these fish generally migrate with attraction flow, so you can see um, in the little river diagram and on the right there that the current is moving around the river and you don't want it to be too fast but you want it to be somewhere in that line of where the river is actually flowing because that's where the fish generally try to swim through. So the target species, we're targeting alewives specifically um, and but the other species that were present in this year and years past were Blueback herring, American shad, gizzard shad, and sea lamprey. And all of these are diadromous fish. So the alewife is really the fish that we're really focusing on. They're kind of the most prevalent fish we're finding in these traps. So that's kind of what we're keying in on to, to, to trap for and use them as an indicator of if the 
projects are successful, if there's passage here, because these guys kind of get all the way through into all the waters as long as they're able to and the water quality and river is kind to them. So alewife, they're an anadromous species, meaning they live their adult lives in the marine environment, then they migrate into estuaries before they run up the rivers to spawn. And that's what we're looking for is we're trying to see if these alewives are running into these rivers where these dams were and now are not to see if these alewives are now running into habitat that was no longer there to them because this dam was in the way and now if they're able to access that habitat. So they're a species of concern which is important because there means their species is declining. Um, so this is one of the reasons why this research is important. We're trying to get as many of these fish back as possible because they're really important um, ecosystem, a keystone species in the ecosystem. Um, there are also a schooling fish, so there's in generally lots of them at a time in a big school migrating at one time. And there's a moratorium on them in New England, meaning the take of them is prohibited. So a little bit of about a description about an alewife. They're streamlined, they're laterally compressed this way, not this way. They have a deep body towards the head. Um, they're silver, white in color. They have a greenish purple hue along their dorsal side, that top side that you can kind of see in the picture. Um, they're about 10 inches long and they've got a really deeply forked tail. That deeply forked tail allows them to swim really fast, evade predators, and allows them to migrate really strongly and really well. They have a single gill, uh, they have a single black spot behind their gill plate, which acts as a false eye, which kind of confuses predators. It kind of makes it hard to tell which way the fish is facing and in a school where the fish uh, are migrating in that school. And then you can see in that picture, they've got some large scales there that are really big and they slough off pretty easily. So in visual surveys, sometimes you can see if there's a bottleneck or low water, you can see the alewives migrated through there from those large scales sloughing off. Um, their role in the ecosystem, they're zooplanktivorous. So when the open ocean, they eat all of the zooplankton out there and then they harvest all, or they kind of contain all of that nutrients from the zooplankton and then they get big and fat on it and then everything else eats them. They're a forage fish. So they're on the kind of the bottom of the food chain and they're forage fish for everything. They're responsible for bringing that nutrients from the zooplankton from open water into freshwater ecosystems. Um, they do this by one, having them in their adult migrations being preyed upon, and then their eggs get preyed upon by larval fish and small fish, and they produce a lot of eggs. It's estimated anywhere from 30,000 to 150,000 eggs per female each spawn. And sometimes the fish will spawn twice in a season if, the, if all of the conditions are right. Um, each egg is an average of 0.9 millimeters. And because of all of the predation upon of the eggs, about only one in every 80,000 hatchlings will reach the sea. And then once they're adults, um, they're highly preyed upon to and from their spawning grounds as well, meaning that they really, really transfer nutrients really well. They're a really key keystone player in the keeping the ecosystem functioning from not having too much nutrients in the open ocean or too much nutrients up in the rivers as well. Um, there's a couple of reasons uh, why their populations are in decline. Um, one of the reasons is by bycatch, so fishermen going out um, and catching the wrong fish. Um, they'll get herring, river herring and alewives in their, in their nets. Um, and Bill, Lucy is working really well on doing some policy changes with that, doing some great work there, working on bycatch. Um, also habitat loss and water habitat loss. When a dam goes up, it's really detrimental. The fish can't get to their desired spawning habitats. And then water quality degradation, um, the Western Sound Office is working really hard on this, making sure that the harbors and the sounds and everything is staying clean. There's no excess nit nitrogen or algal blooms to have fish kills in these rivers. But the habitat loss, once we remove these dams, now we're moving forward and now the fish can now access this habitat. It's no longer lost. And that's where the monitoring comes in. And that's what I'm monitoring now that these dams are down to see if now fish can get into these areas where they weren't able to. So 
this is what everyone's interested in the data what what was caught in the 2020 fish trapped um in the so hide pond we had 325 alewives this year 18 blueback herring which was really exciting uh, it was the first time they've been documented this high in the watershed um since the dam was removed or in this watershed since the 80s so that was really exciting they were it was great find, same thing, American Shad, we got four this year, and it was the first time they were found um, uh, upstream of the dam since the dam was pulled down. Um, same, uh, no sea lamprey, we got two striped bass, which was really interesting, they were super small. The hypothesis is, is that they were resident fish making their, um, trying to get a little bit more rust, robust before they migrate next season in the estuary there. So in total, there was 349 uh, diadromous fish caught this year in the Hyde Pond Trap. Long Pond Trap, there was nothing there, which is not a bad thing. Um, we didn't catch any diadromous fish up there, but it was an interesting site. We learned a lot from it and there will be things moving forward. Um, Hot Haley's Pond, we did a presence absence survey there. Um, Caught three fish almost right off the bat. We put the trap in a little bit before we knew the fish were gonna be migrating. And then we pulled the trap right after we caught the three. So that was a successful survey, three alewives proving that that was um, passable. Uh, Alewife Cove, we did not catch anything there. Unfortunately, the day we put the traps in, we encountered some muskrat issues where uh, the muskrat started chewing holes through the traps relatively quickly. And if, and if there was anything caught in the trap, they would have been chewed and been able to get through the muskrat holes. Knoll's Pond, this was the record year of alewives going through Pond Lily Dam Removal Site. Um, so we trap upstream in Knoll's Pond um, to prove once again that the fish are moving all the way through the dam removal site. So there was 50, um, 50 alewives moved through. We got, and we got one sea lamprey and one American eel. It was trap. It was all caught up in the trap when I was. It was a little one caught up in the trap when I was pulling the trap. So that was exciting to see. And Norwalk River, we unfortunately did not survey any fish there due to one. The first trap was installed. It was blown away in the uh, April fourteenth. Really heavy storm. Just got washed away. Couldn't find it. Found a couple bits and pieces, but the trap was just gone. So by the time we installed it, it was a little bit late in the season, but we tried still and the tr trap we used just wasn't site specific. So it didn't have a good trapping efficiency. Um, so other species we caught, um, we caught yellow and hide, yellow perch, golden shiners, chain pickerel, um, long pond, we got pumpkin seeds and bluegill, nothing at all in Haley's pond besides alewife. Um, alewife Cove did not catch anything because of the muskrat holes. Um, Pond Lily, the Knowles Pond site, ended up catching a lot of fish. It had 10 yellow perch, four golden shiners, 12 chain pickerel, um, four white sucker, eight largemouth bass, one red breast sunfish, uh, eight pumpkin seeds, and 26 bluegill. And Norwalk River was just not site specific, and the first trap got washed away, so it did not catch anything. So days fishing, a little bit of interesting data. Um, Hyde Pond was in the water fishing for 74 days. Um, pond Lily was 67 days, Long Pond 36. Hyde Pond was, uh, Haley's Pond was quick because it was quick presence absence. Alewife Cove, same thing, presence absence. Muskrats made the presence, well, presence a little bit more challenging. And uh, Norwalk River was 36 days. Um, so a little catch per unit effort. Um, this is how many fish were caught for how many days the traps were in the water fishing. So how many days fishing um, is the unit of effort and the catch is how many fish were caught. So at Hyde Pond, there was 325 alewife caught over 74 days. So that averages out to be about 4.4 fish per day. Just pretty good run. Long hey, John. Pond. John, we're getting some, some good questions in and I'd love to, to get to some of them um, before, the, before the half hour. Um, right. 
do you want to take a couple now or do you want to do you want to finish out the last couple of slides and uh sure i can take a couple now okay um one of them is is leading directly to your last slide so um that one the uh yeah. well france is asking uh, what you learned from the ponds where there were no results and for that matter beyond the numbers what did you learn from the other sites this year so the other sites where so we didn't catch anything at alewife cove what i learned there is that muskrats will do some serious damage um, the traps were just a little bit too big for the water levels there um i was trying to prove if the traps were able to if fish were able to move through the um, river there, I tried to do three different traps to prove which of the three culvert pipes was passable. Um, and the muskrat chewed through um, the site right away. So in, in future years, for a site like this where there's muskrat activity, using chicken wire instead of this plastic Vexar or just a more rigid, um, a more rigid netting would be more helpful in, in the future instead of this Vexar. Although the Vexar is nice because it's light and flexible. Um, and then Long Pond, um, same thing that we learned a lot about the region in front or behind it because Long Pond is immediately upstream of the Hyde Pond Dam. So we wanted to see, and it's the next um, immediate large barrier on that river. So we wanted to see if the fish were moving all the way up there. So we said, we were able to see, okay, well, we didn't get any fish at Long Pond. Nope, they're not able to do this. So we did a couple stream walks and we found a couple small natural barriers in the stream, like beaver dams and stuff. So um, we learned some interesting things about that entire body, body of water, Whitford Brook there, from not catching anything at Long Pond. Um, and yeah, we'll quickly catch per unit effort. You can see that we did not breach the beaver dam. We left it there. We're too, too early in any of the process. We found it like a couple weeks ago, so we didn't, didn't do anything specific with it yet. Um, but, um, We'll go to relative abundance. So 91% of the fish who moved through Whitford Brook through Hyde Pond Dam removal at this time, 91% of the biomass moving through was alewives. Long Pond, no, no alewives. 100% of what moved through Haley's Pond culverts were alewives. And 36% of pond lilies biomass moving through that area was Wives. So this is an important slide, um, 2020 versus past years. So 2017, where at Hyde Pond, when the grant was um, received, um, the traps were gotten too late, so no alewives were caught. There's three different species. It was largemouth bass and a couple sunfish, and no diadromous fish were caught. 2018 at Hyde Pond, um, I see a couple questions coming in. Yeah, John, why don't you uh, finish finish up and then I'll we'll do a, a question or two. Cool. Um, 2018, 1,284 alewives moved through. Those were all of the diadromous fish. 2019 was an interesting year. The rained a lot and the flood, uh, the trap got kind of trashed and destroyed in the floods. So only 42 fish were caught that were diadromous. And in 2020, um, 325 alewives and 349 diadromous fish were caught. Um, we caught the four, the 18 blueback herring, four American shad, and the two um, striped bass in there. Um, and pond lily as well, interestingly, um, 2017, no diadromous fish. A lot of diadromous fish in 2018, 34, 2019, only seven, but there was also a gizzard shad caught in there. And then also a, the first time uh, a sea lamprey was found in that river system that high. And then this year, record year for alewives in 
Pond Lily, 50 alewives, and there was a um, sea lamprey as well in that trap this year as well. So, um, and then to highlight the 2009 culvert restoration in Brybrook, that Connecticut deep monitors with an electronic fish counter. Um, in 2009, when the culvert was restored, it looked like the picture on the top right. Um, there were 74,000 fish. And then this year, it goes all the way up to uh, four, 409,000 fish. So drastic increase with this project. So that's monitored each year. Um, so great trend there. That's a successful story for sure for restoration project. Um, so the key takeaways, the major thing is that the migratory fish runs are highly dynamic. They fluctuate year to year drastically. Um, and there's ev but there is evidence to show that there is an increase in the size of the fish run. So perfect example is the Bride Brook example. That, that run is so robust now that the state is able to take some and seed alewives around and use them to per, um, kind of help come along some other alewife runs um, that are struggling a little bit. Um, and there's um, 2018 went a high pond immediately after the dam was removed. That was a giant run. Now we're getting higher biodiversity in the fish runs from years past now that the fish are able to move and the river is open. Um, so there's indication because of the higher biodiversity and fish able to make it through that there is a positive ecological impacts for dam removals and our restoration projects. And one of the major things also is that this restoration and research must be continued so we can keep monitoring and keep making sure that this fish run is robust in the future. Um, that's the most important thing that the more that's done to ensure that these fish can reach their spawning habitat and keep the ecosystem healthy and provide food for other things, the more prevalent all the other biodiversity in the river and Long Island Sound will be. So it's super important that this research must continue and the restoration is definitely having positive ecological impacts. So thank you very much. I can answer some questions now. All right. Thank you so much, John, John Vanderwerf. We appreciate you. Um, I do want to name that it is uh, 1232. So if folks have to go, um, thank you very much for joining us. We are going to stick around and do a couple questions uh, with John, though. So if you can stick around, if you have the time, uh, feel free. And continue to send in questions if you have them. So, uh, John, one question came through that is interesting. Are you able to determine an alewife versus blueback herring in a non-lethal way? So, the easiest way to do it is the lethal way looking at the peritoneum, but what I was able to determine this year with um, a lot of collaboration and debate with um, Steve Geppert and Kevin Jobs at Connecticut Deep that um, I started looking at them once I saw reports of the blueback herring in other locations that were close to the Hyde Pond dam removal site. And all of a sudden I saw a couple fish that were smaller, which is a general trend for um, blueback herring. Their eyes were closer to their snout than the bigger and larger alewives were in proportion. Um, and they had a, a darker back. So compared to the alewives, they just had a darker general sheen, which is kind of where the blue, the blue back herring name comes from. And you can see that part on the inside by looking at the peritoneum. So they look darker. I took a couple um, pictures. I sent it to Steve and Kevin. I took one scale sample and there was a paper. Um, I forget the name, something with an M off the top of my head, Miloro, something like that, um, put out saying that there's a different shape to an alewife scale versus a, a blueback scale. The blueback scale goes in on one side of where the scale connects to the actual fish. So I looked at that. It appeared, I didn't have a microscope, but under magnifying glass, it appeared that it did. So we're, we're about 90% sure that these fish are, were this year blueback herring. Um, I didn't feel comfortable culling any of them this year. 
to say yes it, definitively they were there. But between the three fish biologists, me, Steve Gephardt, and Kevin Jobs, we feel strongly that these ones this year were blueback herring by those couple different morphometrics. And they're also uh, from their, um, their anal fin to their caudal fin. There's, it's more of a, a, it's described in the literature as a saw belly. And by that, compared to the alewife is not supposed to cut your finger as much as kind of what some of the literature says. And the bluebacks definitely had a sharper scale structure on that ridge between their, the kind of their cloaca vent to their caudal fin. That's super interesting. Thank, thank you for that question. Uh, and thanks for addressing that, John. Yep. Um, so there have been a couple questions about elvers uh, and why we don't or whether we monitor for elvers. I mean, obviously we, we show data and we record data on American eel, like brown eel, like, but are the elvers just too small and they'll get through the mesh in the trap or how does that work? Yeah, so the small eels get through the mesh of the trap right now. And if the mesh was, this, these specific traps were any smaller, um, just the high water in the fall, I mean, in the spring would just rip them downstream. So we have to keep the mesh diameter relatively large. So for just hydrodynamics of the river, it doesn't pull the trap downstream, which it does happen um, even with these traps. Um, so the elvers make it through. I, I found a small, it wasn't, I don't know if it would be elver size, but I found a small, maybe about like nine inch eel, technically elver, maybe not. Um, when I was pulling the trap out, it was just like intertangled in the trap, like kind of using it as habitat, I would call it. Um, but we, we see them when we electrofish in the summer. Um, we are in the farm river fish ladder and we just installed that Pages Mill. We did just install are uh, in process of installing an eel passage system. So I am going to start monitoring there. Um, right now, it's just kind of a hurdle that we haven't been doing yet and I'm interested to start. So if you have any advice or um, any ways of helping monitoring for Elvers, I'd greatly send me an email. I appreciate it. Um, I'd be definitely interested in chatting, talking about monitoring Elvers. I'd love to start doing it if possible. It'd be great. Great, and John, are you are you okay with me just throwing your email in the in the chat? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, contacts section two. Yeah. Okay, and uh, maybe one more. Are are local fishermen contributing to sightings, even if anecdotal? I mean, you're the one monitoring all your traps, but um, how how do local fishermen play a role in this if they do? Yes, we do do some volunteer surveys where fishermen go out and will, um, we, we did that at Alewife Cove last year. This year with the COVID restrictions, we weren't able to do our um, fishermen surveys or volunteer surveys. So we do get local fishermen and anglers and doing surveys for us and we take those into account. Um, this year, we weren't able to do them. Um, as far as like commercial fishing goes, I don't necessarily know about any monitoring that goes along with that. I focus more on the rivers. Bill might know, Bill Lucy might know a little bit more about commercial fishing regulations and commercial monitoring. Um, I know um, there are on fishing vessels, people who do monitor bycatch and stuff like that, um, but I'm not, I'm not sure about specific actual commercial fishing monitoring. Yeah, uh, I, I think he, he would know more about that um, and maybe maybe he's talked about that in a past webinar i'm trying to remember um or maybe we could do one with him in the future and yeah. i i think my my response to one of these questions would also be similar which is um there's a question about information on fresh on the freshwater claims called the ly floater and whether we have any data about them or we're collecting any data about them in any of these projects um, I'll let John uh, take a stab at that, but also we have someone on our team who's very interested in in, in those, and uh, and so maybe we'll try and maybe we'll try and get at least a blog post, if not um, 
if not a webinar going on that. Yeah, we're, we're not doing anything with them monitoring anything. They are fascinating. Um, yeah, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure if they've been found in this region yet. Um, I, I, I think they're in the Hudson and I know they're in the Chesapeake, but I'm not sure. I'm not a hundred percent sure. We're not doing anything about it. And like same with the, the eel monitoring, I would definitely interested in monitoring for it. If, if possible in a non-lethal way would be interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, I think we're going to call it. Um, John, we really appreciate your time and expertise on this. Thank you for sharing with us today. And thanks to everyone who joined us. Uh, we appreciate your support and coming into these rooms and into these spaces and, and uh, exploring these topics with us. We also uh, really appreciate any other support, especially right now. Uh, we are not immune as a nonprofit to uh, the impacts of coronavirus. So if you have capacity uh, and you can help us out by becoming a member or donating, you can do that at www.savethesound.org slash donate. All right, until next time, folks, we are signing off here. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you, everyone.